I'm an agricultural economics major at the University of Georgia. And being an economist, and being an economist, my friends always pick on me and have the best economist jokes. For example, one day a woman wasn't feeling very well, so she went to the doctor. At the end of the visit, the doctor told her she only had six months to live, and he recommended that she marry an economist. She looked at him with a confused look and said, will this cure my illness? He simply said, no, but the six months will seem pretty long. I'm proud to call our next speaker a fellow economist who doesn't believe this joke any more than I do. He's commonly referred to as a futurist because of his optimistic thinking and, for, because of his optimistic th thinking and way of looking at the world. He received his bachelor's degree from West Texas State, master's degree from New Mexico State University, and doctorate of economics degree from Iowa State University. He's currently the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences at New Mexico State University. He's a past National FFA officer and continues to inspire others and grow our future through public speaking. He's a consultant for the U.S. Departments of Agriculture, the Interior, Labor, and Defense. And I think FFA ought to hire him too. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our keynote speaker tonight, Dr. Lowell Catlett. Thank you very much, Kane, for that very, very kind introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, you can do a little bit better than that. Good evening. It's, I really deeply appreciate the opportunity to be back to convention. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I uh, uh, owe a great deal uh, to the FFA. It's uh, been a big part of my life, and somebody, uh, when they got wind that I was going to be speaking at the convention, uh, thought they'd have a little fun with me, so they uh, uh, emailed me a photograph of the 1968-69 uh, uh, photograph of my officer team. Um, I didn't recognize myself. Um, uh, I was, of course, I was about 20 pounds ago and a lot of hair ago, um, and so I'm looking at it, and, and I, then I had to start smiling because I sure didn't look like the photo, but uh, I got to smiling because what I could do was stand back and look at the 40-odd years since that photograph was taken, and I could do it from the vantage point of saying that I've had one of the most incredible, wonderful lives that I've ever could ever imagine, and I got to look back on that photograph knowing that I've had an incredible and wonderful life. But I had an incredible and wonderful life, uh, in part and maybe wholly, because of the start that I got in FFA. I don't say that to pander to you. I tell you that because I sincerely and deeply mean that. And I hope that in 40 odd years, when somebody plays that same trick on you and emails you and God knows how they're gonna do it in 40 years, yeah. but you're gonna see that picture of yourself here at the convention and hopefully all of you, and I wish for all of you, that you'll look back from the same vantage point and say that you've had an incredible and wonderful life, and FFA would be a part of it. It's fabulous what this organization can do. But you know, no matter how incredible and wondrous it is, I'm, I'm an old man, okay? I'm 63, okay? If I'm vertical in the morning, now I'm happy, okay? okay? okay. And you know, as you get older, you start going to the doctor more, and I think it's probably just because you want a little uh, condolences or something like that. And I went to mine not too long ago, a few months ago, and, and I hate it when they take all, they poke you and they gouge you and they take all these tests and then they walk out of the room and then they let you sit for like an hour and then they come back in and the doctor's sitting there and he's got this little notepad and he's kind of got a sour look on his face and he's shaking his head and he said, well, it's not terrible, Lowell, but it's not good. Said, the best thing you can do is you've got to quit eating everything that's put in front of you. <laughs> and you've got to start sleeping more because you you're a night owl. You stay up all the time. And for God's sake, you have got to cut down your red wine consumption. <laughs> it's the best thing you can do, Lowell. 
And I looked at him and said, you know, Doc, I don't deserve the best. Uh, what's second best? <laughs> so he told me, and so I got a new doctor, okay? I didn't like the second best either. But I'm sitting there thinking, okay, now wait a minute, I'm 63. Gee, many, I, have, I haven't got much left in life. I really don't, I have too many years left. So I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, the average American lives to be 79. Men, however, live to be 76. Women live forever, somehow it averages 79, okay? okay? <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, 76, holy cow, 76, if I live the average time and I'm 63, I've got, I've got 13 years left. And I'm going, I have got to stretch this out. I have got to figure out how I can live longer, okay? So I'm sitting there thinking, okay. So I, I, I start going back through all of the actuarial tables from uh, insurance companies and all the epidemiological studies. And I'm going, how, how can I live longer? Okay, so let's see, 76 and let's see, well, wait a minute. The study shows that red wine consumption is good for you in moderation. So I added a year on that one. And then the new doctor I had defined what moderation was. Um, so I have another new doctor now. Uh, and I had to take that one off, needless to say. So I just skipped the red wine. I didn't add that one. So, but then I got to thinking, okay, here comes another study that shows this. Married men live three years longer on average than single men. Okay? We get the marriage premium. Okay? Okay? Women don't get it. Okay? You don't get the marriage premium, okay? But wait a minute, hold on to that thought because we're gonna come back to it because some good science came out this year that tells us why. But you don't get it, men do. Men on average, married men on average live three years longer than single men. We've also found, I found a study that shows that married men are more willing to die, but they do live on average three years longer, okay? okay. okay. So now I've got 76, and then I got the marriage premium. So I'm now up to 79, okay? And then I start, I found this study that shows that, that uh, and it's a very set of complicated mathematical models and stuff, and it's, it's called the paradox of aging. It seems like the, the older you get, the higher the probability you're going to get older. Up until the day you just die, and that's why they call it a paradox, okay? <laughs> and that's why mathematicians are weird, okay? But anyway, so we got this paradox of aging, which essentially says this, okay? An 80-year-old has a higher probability of making it to 90 than a 20-year-old. Because what kills you between 20 and 80, the 80-year-old has already gone through, okay? Okay? So are you with me now? So I add this paradox of aging, and I'm now up to 83, okay? okay. So I got 20 more years. But that's kind of nebulous, you know? So I'm, I'm trying to put it in terms I understand. So I got 20 more Super Bowls to watch. 20 more World Series to watch. And in a presidential election year, thank God I only got four more of these to go through. Okay? okay. But I say that tongue-in-cheek because, thank God, we get to vote. So I got some advice for you on the next time a presidential election comes around. Take Seth's advice, because he said it to you very eloquently just a few minutes ago. Don't poison your mind by watching TV and reading newspapers because all we're going to do in an election year is poke each other in the eye, okay? We're going to poke each other in the eye and say, we can do it better than you can do. Okay, 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 okay. Just read history and forget about it and go vote, okay? Okay? But the reason I tell you that's important is because guess what? When we're done voting, and if we don't get the outcome we want in America, guess what we do? We don't burn the palace down, and we don't get the military to go kill our opponent. We just simply lick our wounds and say, we'll try again another time. And let me tell you, the world sees that too, okay? Because this quarter, 2012, the world has a lot of place to invest their money. 
but foreign capital came into the United States of America to this tune, first quarter, 2012. One trillion dollars of foreign capital came in because they said, you know what, this is the best place to put it. And the next two quarters, it came in at the fastest rate ever in history. So this vantage point you're going to look back on in 40 years, what's it going to be from? And the best way I know how to tell you to get ready for it is something we call in forecasting the theory of the long nose, okay? Which says essentially this, despite what your mother used to tell you about, do not stick your nose in other people's business. Yeah, you got to, okay? okay. You got to stick your nose in other organizations, other groups, other companies. Figure out what they're doing. Can you apply it to your life? Can you take what you're doing and apply it to somebody else? It's called the theory of the long nose because if you really use it wisely, you can go back into history and look at it. And you can look back when this organization started, 1928. Guess what? 1928, the world had 1.2 billion people. Okay? The United States population was one tenth of it. We produced about one tenth of what the world produced. 1928. Fast forward 40 years to when I was first elected as a national officer. 1968. The world's population had swelled to 3.5 billion people. Now we were no longer one-tenth of the world's population. America was only 6% of the world's population. But we had grown to 20% of its output. And today, the world's population stands at 7 billion. 7 billion people. And we're no longer not 6%. We're 2.5% of the population producing 30, 30% of everything produced in the world. <laughs> Phenomenal. Oh, and by the way, if you go back and look at that 1928 when we had 1.2 billion people, you know what? Of those 1.2 billion people, 600 million of them were either malnourished, underfed, starving to death, because we could not produce enough food for 1.2 billion people. And then fast forward to 68, when it had swelled to 3.5 billion people. Now it wasn't 600 million people that couldn't eat. It was 2 billion people that were malnourished, because we could not still produce enough food. Because it takes 2,450 calories on average for the average person to live every day. 2,200 on average for women, 2,700 for men, 2,450. Average it out. We couldn't produce that until today. Those 7 billion people, we now produce enough calories, more than enough, 2,700 on average, for all 7 billion people on the planet. That's phenomenal. You think we're going to feed the next two billion? Kind of. <laughs> You'll figure out a way to do it. But ooh, what a powerful thing that's going on. Because it isn't just about feeding a hungry world now. Because guess what happens? Something miraculous happened last year, too. The United States of America found this out. We now spend less of our disposable income than at any time in history to eat. 9.5%, lowest in the world, lowest it's ever been. You don't spend jack to eat in this country. <laughs> but here comes another little paradox. If you can spend less, then guess what? You can spend more. And we are spending more. We're now entering this phenomenal golden age of agriculture where, guess what? Now we're about, well, I want slow food. Could I have local food? Ten years ago, we didn't measure this one. It's 4% of the food sector and growing organic. Five years ago, we didn't measure this one. Now it's 1.7% growing, gluten-free. You now are finding out, folks, guess what? <laughs> I can feed a hungry world, and I can let you eat in weird and different ways. Okay? Because now it is not uncommon for the vegetables and the salad that you eat in a fancy New York restaurant to have come from a roof garden and the ore getting honey from a hive of bees next door. Oh, what a new world of agriculture. Phenomenal. Blow your doors off. 
Okay. But get ready. Here comes a whole bunch of other technologies that are just going to drive your mind plumb crazy. Okay. Let me start first and foremost with this one. Let's go back to understanding about when I told you that women did not get the marriage premium. And let me tell you how science found that out. Because I put it this way. You want to have healthy people? You can't separate them from plants and animals and people. You can try. Doesn't work. Okay? We like plants and animals and people. Okay? And we're finding it out every day. Because here come the interesting ones. Okay? Women don't get the marriage premium because guess what? We find out that mothers and children bond. A woman can go through the most difficult childbearing on the planet, and the moment that that new infant is put in her arms, she generally smiles. Okay? <laughs> generally. <laughs> it seems that all medical science could say about it before was it was the mother-child bond. Well, guess what we're finding out, folks? <laughs> It's more than that. It's called biochemistry. Because we now find out that if you are in the presence and near something that you like, a human, if you like them, then your body starts kicking out at least 100 known chemicals to date, most of them steroids, one particular steroid called oxytocin. Oxytocin just makes you giddy. Okay. And guess what we just found out on those newborn infants and their mothers within 30 minutes? The mother and the child's oxytocin levels become identical. Now, my wife is five feet tall, weighs 100 pounds when it's raining. We've been married 28 years, been together 33. I love this woman. I mean, I... I... I love her. I think. Because okay, okay. there's got to be a little biochemistry in it. Because I do know this when I'm in her presence. I'm just giddy as hell. <laughs> and when I'm not, I, I drink heavily. Okay. <laughs> Guess what we find out about couples and people that are together? They, <laughs> oxytocin levels become identical. We want to have healthy people. We can't separate them from people. We like people. We like to be around them. Bonding chemicals. And let me tell you why it's important. Study just done. Brigham Young, Brigham Young University just found this one out. If you have deep and rich social contacts, the people that do die from all forms of death at a rate half of those that don't. You need to be around people. Okay? And then a study by Carnegie Mellon found out this, and this is powerful, found out this. If you have deep and rich social contacts with people, you are four times less likely to get an infection because your immune system is four times stronger. I know you're going, well, what's that got to do with feeding people, huh? Just because they like to be around each other, won't be. Well, hmm. Australian doctor who understood how kangaroos birthed their new roos and kept them in the pouch for a period of time before they were actually brought out of their pouch. And guess what was happening the whole time that they were in that pouch? maturing enough to come out and live outside as their oxytocin levels of the mother and the rue were becoming identical. He said, wait a minute. What do we do for premature babies in this country? They have no immune system, so we separate them from their mother. Can't, al can't allow that to happen. And so he started a process in human medicine because he had the sense to observe Mother Nature about kangaroos, and he started a process called kangarooing, which says you take those premature infants, yes, you protect them, but for a certain period of time, they're brought and they're laid on the bosom of their mother. And guess what happens 
to their immune system. It starts growing. And guess what happens to their overall health? It starts growing. Hmm. And what do we do in dairy animals when we don't want those young male calves because they don't give milk? We isolate them immediately. And their death rate is phenomenally high. Except Chuck Eckert at Pacific Foods right outside of Portland, Oregon, with three organic dairy, said, wait a minute, because his new herdsman from Columbia had read about the Aussie and kangarooing and said, wait a minute, why don't you let me try something? I know that they are prone to spread diseases, but wait a minute, they're, they're herd animals, so, so, so maybe if I just put those male calves together. And guess what happened? Their immune systems got stronger. <laughs> and their death rates went down and <laughs> my wife and I had the pleasure of living with a Chesapeake Bay Retriever by the name of Tango <laughs> most wonderful creature other than my wife that I ever had the opportunity to share time on this earth with a wonderful creature. She lived on this earth 15 years and 60 days. During the last few weeks of her life, when she would be unsettled, I would lay down on the bed with her and put my arm around her. And in a few minutes, her breathing would ease and she would go to sleep. So would I. And guess what we found out last year? The oxytocin levels in her and me. <laughs> it isn't just about human and human bonds. It's about human and animals. You want to have healthy people. You can't separate them from plants and animals and people because the animals do it and the plants do it too. Okay. My wife is a landscape architect. First 20 years of her career, she designed commercial parks and commercial buildings. Last five years of her career, green roofs, green walls, riding trails for horses, leashless dog parks, healing gardens for hospitals, peace gardens for hospice. What a new world. What a new world. And all of you young men and women, you've grown up in a life where you've never known life without this. Believe it or not, these things used to have wires attached to them. <laughs> and they were called telephones. And they were all about us talking to each other by voice. And somebody with a long nose goes, oh, they're, they're really just a radio. So let's just make them a receiver and a transmitter and we can cut the wires and they'll be mobile. And then somebody in 2004 said, well, if you're going to carry the thing around, why don't you put something else on it? Make it do something. Well, how about a camera? 2004, we put a camera on them finally. And since 2004, in the last eight years, the number of photographs the average American has taken has done what? It's gone up eightfold. Okay. We have no idea where they are. They're in cyberspace somewhere, but they've gone. We, we take more pictures than ever. But then somebody with a theory of long nose said, well, wait a minute, if it's got a camera in oh, why don't I just take out that camera lens and put in a molecular lens, which is a molecule of oil and water that electrical impulses will change the focus of 60 times a second, and then I'll put a near-infrared laser on it, and then that near-infrared laser, I can take that camera from my cell phone and look at that blemish on my skin, and that laser will go underneath the skin by about one-tenth of an inch, and the molecular lens will do patterns of light and dark, and I can tell whether it is benign or cancerous. And then someone said, well, let's just take that molecular lens out and put in what's called a software lens, which just use mathematical algorithms to change patterns of light and dark. And then we'll take a little drop of blood, take your cell phone, and I can do an instant blood test. And then someone real bright said in the dairy industry, I'll just make that app, change the lens on it, and then I'll look at a drop of milk and I'll get an instant reading of the somatic cell count. 
It's kind of pricey right now, 1,800 bucks. But it's instant. <laughs> and then in 1990, somebody said, I think we can unwind this human DNA helix. I think we can. So a whole bunch of scientists in dozens of laboratories, hundreds of them, thousands of technicians before it was done, started unwinding the human DNA helix. 13 years later, we announced to the world, science did, 2003, 13 years, all three billion base pairs of the human genome have been sequenced at about a buck each, three billion bucks. 13 years, thousands of people. Miraculous accomplishment. And this year, a commercial DNA chip was released for $1,000. That'll do it in two hours. I don't know about you, I'm kind of seeing a trend there. What do you think? Seconds? Pennies? Instant DNA? <laughs> well, if I got instant DNA, then how about the most complicated thing we put in our bodies every day is something called food. Hmm. And all we can say today, the best science we can do is tell you, well, this is a good cholesterol, this is a bad cholesterol, you don't want that alkaloid. <laughs> but with an instant DNA chip in my cell phone, <laughs> and now I know whether that cholesterol is good for me and bad for you. I call it prescription food. <laughs> what are you going to call that? I don't know. But I do know this. Get ready. Because here comes the most phenomenal golden age ever in this broad thing called agriculture. Because we can now feed a hungry world. And we can feed them with weird and different foods. And it is as much about having the fact that three years ago we quit destroying forest now and for the last three years have planted more trees than we've destroyed. Hmm. And for the first time in 20 years our carbon dioxide level is the lowest it's been in 20 years. So we're feeding a hungry world and protecting a fragile planet in the process. But let me leave you the story about my wife, an FFA member, landscape architect. Interesting. In the little community we live in in southern New Mexico called Las Cruces, beautiful, <laughs> wonderful place. Beautiful Rio Grande runs down through it. Rio Grande has always been used for people to recreate, okay. except it was not formal. You just had to go find a place to kind of be by the river. But my wife said, you know, as the landscape architect for the city, she said, you know, we, why can't we have a park where people can go to? And they said, well, it's because it's controlled by the Interstate Commerce Commission, Stream Commission, and they're the feds, and they won't work with you, and the city, you'd have to annex the land from the city, and the city won't do that, and the town of Messier, I can't do it. Well, people need it. So she went to the feds and, yeah, great idea. Went to the city of Las Cruces, great idea. Went to the town of Mesilla, great idea. All worked together. Now we have miles of a beautiful park along a beautiful river with riding trails for horses and walking trails for dogs. And the water in that river feeds a wonderful productive agriculture next door. Last year of our dog Tango's life, she was blind. She's a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, so I really felt sorry for the poor girl, because here she was living in the driest part of the world, and she liked to swim, and so 
My wife and I got in the habit of every morning about 5 a.m. to take her to the river so she could swim and wade and act like she was in the Chesapeake Bay. But the last year when she went blind, she didn't know light, daylight from dark. So instead of waking up at 5 in the morning so I could take her to the river, she would sometimes wake up at 2 in the morning, start barking. It's like river time. <laughs> so I'd get her in the pickup with the other dog who's like, what's going on here? <laughs> and we'd go to the river, to the park that my wife built. And at two in the morning in southern New Mexico, there's no clouds, no humidity. If you got a set of binoculars, you can see the four moons of Jupiter and a little bit of the spiral of the M80 galaxy. And the Milky Way is milky. And it reminded me as a kid growing up on a ranch in the Panhandle of Texas, when after a hard day of work, my late father and I would lay down on the grass and look up at the sky because there's no clouds there and no humidity. And my love of astronomy came from it. And here was this dog at two in the morning and I'm out there looking at the stars again. The dog did that. The world you're going to look back on is about feeding a hungry world. It's about this. And the technology will be about this. And it also has to be about this. <laughs> because it's going to be a place where a blind dog can take an old man and let him see the stars again. Remember the old saying, the greatest thing you will ever learn is to love and be loved in return. Hey, FFA. Let's go build that world. Dr. Catlett. Dr. Catlett, thank you so much for joining us here tonight, for telling us stories, for providing a perspective, for making us think, for making us laugh, and bringing it all back into agriculture. We thank you so much for your support of this blue jacket and everything it means to us and everything it's meant to you. We'd like to present you with this gift as a token of our appreciation for being here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Dr. Lowell Catlett. Thank you.